Okay. I am assuming I'm on. All right. Uh, oh. Okay. Hi. Welcome to Questions and Mamsers. I am Janelle. I'm the pastor at Pine United Methodist Church, and for this week, I've been doing, um, or this week, for this month, during Pride Month, I've been doing uh, weekly live videos to kind of like engage with folks and to um, see folks, see how folks are doing, particularly people of faith are doing, especially during these times when it's hard for us to gather and to come together as community, I'm trying to find more touch points to be able to um, just stay grounded and connected with one another, especially during Pride. Um, as I had mentioned before, um, I'm the pastor of Pine, uh, one of the first Asian Pacific, uh, Asian American, predominantly Asian American congregations to uh, call themselves reconciling or in the Methodist Church, open and affirming of LGBTQ people. And so, um, yeah. So I'm going to kind of field in some questions here, and I, I really appreciate how, um, I guess, I appreciate conversations with people of faith. Um, I appreciate conversations with folks where they don't only see me as a pastor and they don't only see me as representing church, <laughs> that they see people of faith as whole people. Um, and appreciating conversations with folks that um, are not just, um, you know, dumping their, their church baggage onto me. Because I cannot feel the healing of generations of oppression that the church institution has done. So, I have to create spaces like these in order to have the kind of conversations that I feel are appropriate for people of faith. Uh, deeper conversations for people of faith, you know, conversations that can meet us at our level and in our context. And that is rare to have uh, places where justice and faith is taken into account and where people of faith are seen as whole people. Um, so anyway, um, thank you all for joining A. Kim. Shout outs. Um, I also have some questions that uh, folks have sent me ahead of time. And so as um, Big questions, but you know, here in this space, it's not so much about the answers as Kim had kind of encouraged me before. It's not so much about the answers, but maybe it's about getting to know the mamsers. Me, okay. So, um, also, like, if you have questions, go ahead, put it in the comments. I could see them. So, this first question. Um, how do you feel about what happened in Manila recently? How does that shape the way you think about Pride and the end of Pride Month, or does it? All right, so thanks for that question. For those of you who don't know, um, there was a Pride uh, protest in the Philippines, not protesting LGBTQ people, but a protest composed of LGBTQ people who were um, rising up against tyranny, rising up against um, the, the anti-terrorist bill, which has been like a thing in the Philippines lately. Um, and it's something that's written so broadly that anything can be seen as uh, fitting into uh, terrorism. And so um, folks were, were marching, um, a group called Bahaghari, which means rainbow in Tagalog, also a progressive LGBTQ organization. They were marching with allies, with folks of Gabriella and other people's organizations. And I think from what I saw in the live video, about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes into the, um, the action, uh, police came and violently dispersed the people and arrested 20 of them. So 20 um, folks who were marching in Pride Parade uh, in the Philippines or pride protests in the Philippines are now in prison. Um, they were social distancing, they were wearing masks, they weren't doing anything that they were not supposed to be doing. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Pride this year, I feel like, is 
forcing people to look at a lot of intersections that many of us who are at the intersections have been experiencing for for a long time now. Um, we remember that Pride did start as a protest, you know, like it's attributed to Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, and Stormé de Delver. I, it's a French name. Anyway. <laughs> So these folks are um, credited as being the folks who started um, and sustained the uprisings at Stonewall. And um, we remember that those folks, um, especially Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, were the same folks that were kind of pushed out of the same gay liberation movement that they had kind of helped start. So unfortunately, both Marsha P. and um, Sylvia Rivera are no longer with us in this um, world, um, but I hope that they can feel the, their legacy, uh, their resistance, and I hope that they know that those of us who are on the ground rising up and protesting for the rights of LGBTQ people, um, not just our rights, but like, you know, things like to have our basic needs met, jobs, education, access to health care, I hope that we can remember the spirit of uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera as we go out into those streets. Um, I feel like Pride this year is coming back to the origin of what it was. And I think it's an opportunity for us um, to kind of reconcile and heal from that, that type of exclusion that happened in the past and has and continues to happen. The exclusion of trans people the exclusion of people of color, the exclusion of trans people of color. You know, um, I think that Pride this year is finally getting into the hands of the people who, who started it and for whom the struggle was for, you know, in the first place. So that's that's how I'm feeling around that. Uh, as far as what's going on in the Philippines goes, it's, um, it's a regular experience, unfortunately, for when people assemble in the Philippines. Um, our struggles, as um, I've stated before, our struggles are linked, our struggles are connected. They may look different and have different particularities, but in essence, we're struggling against the same thing. Uh, we're struggling against the same oppressive systems. And as people of faith, it's our responsibility to utilize whatever spiritual gifts we, we have and whatever uh, spiritual practices that we have to use these as tools for liberation in these spaces as well. Um, I confess I haven't been as creative in being able to bring that type of, um, I guess, explicit spirituality in the places that I go to. Um, at the same time, it's, it's, hard for, it's hard for me when people only see me as a church person. <laughs> so therein lies the dilemma. Long answer. Long answer to the question. Wait, no, that is all right. Long answer to the to that question. Second question that I got sent to me: What do you think about the intersection of Black and then in parentheses Trans Lives Matter movement, Juneteenth and Pride Month all at once? I guess I touched on that already a bit. Um, that that everything is just kind of coming together, and um, I wonder if people are actually feeling in a sense, more seen or more whole in this place, um, seeing that other folks are standing up in solidarity with one another. You know, I was walking around Oakland with some friends yesterday, um, checking out a lot of the murals, uh, a lot of them around Black Lives Matter, um, a lot of them lifting up the names of folks who've been killed by police uh, brutality, um, seeing, seeing expressions of solidarity on these on the on the boards um, that are boarding up windows of businesses like those being turned into canvases like that has been really beautiful to see and to experience and I think that definitely art expresses things in ways that conversations can't often do in the ways that academia often cannot do art and culture has its own role and I love that there's more actually more openness to it in um, liberation work. Um, I mean, knowing that these murals are going up also in the midst of, um, of statues being taken down is pretty interesting for, for me to see as well. Anyway, 
Um, yeah, okay. If there are any other questions, please do put them in the comments. I think I can see them all. Um, yeah, because this is the last one. It's the last time you're ever going to be able to ask me questions ever. Just kidding. But, you know, for this month and focusing on Pride. Um, I actually want to know how Pride has been for many of you out there. You all are experiencing similar things with the collision of all of these uh, intersections coming together. Hey, Eileen is with us. What's up? Eileen is my friend from when we grew up. Um, we met playing basketball um, in ju no, yeah, junior high in eighth grade. And we have been friends ever since. Um, and uh, we've been through through a lot of like absurd things, a lot of absurd things in the world, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, I don't. I guess I I don't know what else to say right now. I feel like with pride, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. Um, there's a lot that people are having to hold. Um, there's also a lot of power that people are, are showing and empowerment that people are showing in going out into the world and into the streets and making their voices heard and known. Um, you know, okay, I'm going to wait for your question, I mean, but I'm going to be talking, ask it anyway, while I talk. Anyway, so tomorrow I'm actually going to be part of a panel that connects Philippine Independence Day with Juneteenth and what that means for us as people of faith, right? It's an event that's put on by National Ecumenical, F National Ecumenical Interfaith Forum for Filipino Concerns, or NEFCON. And um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the connections there, the ongoing struggle for liberations that both of our communities experience and um, how, how the violence state violence continues to try to uh, try to shut us down and try to um, you know get rid of get rid of our resistance and the constant struggle all right Becky has a question how do you think embracing queer and trans identities can expand a person's view of God all right uh, from my personal experience I am, I do identify as queer, I do identify as trans, non-binary trans, they, them pronouns, thank you. Um, I think that they can be expansive in the sense that God doesn't have to be tied to our genders. God doesn't have to be tied to any, uh, I mean our as in dominant Western definitions of gender. I feel like some straight Christian allies are pro LGBTQ plus everything. Uh, more about what some Christians are missing in their faith and experience of God. Yeah, I feel like any any kind of charity or top down model like becomes becomes um there's something that's missing there. Even even when we talk about LGBTQ inclusion in the church, it's like you're inclu you're trying the the model is including it, people into a heteronormative white space when um, it should be like we should just shatter those definitions of community and step into a healthier one. Um, definitely being queer has helped me um, think beyond the binaries of, of, um, of labels. You know, queer is one of those labels that's not a, it's a non-label label, alleged, supposedly. Um, actually, when I when I started using it, that's what it was to me. Um, I feel like once you start questioning things, when you start questioning the binaries that our society puts up, and specifically that capitalism creates, and specifically that imperialism creates and tries to enforce on us, you know, and and it it does that so that we can be put into categories, so that we can be neatly shuffled to the margins, and um, once we start questioning those things, I think there's a lot we can unpack about who God is and how God works in the world. 
um, what was it? I think like two or three Sundays ago, we were talking about Trinity Sunday, where we were talking about uh, the nature of God and, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, if you're old school. And um, I, I remember God as Trinity, like having it described to me as God is like, you know, like water. Water can be ice or it can be liquid or it can be vapor, right? And that was, I guess that was satisfying for a while. And then um, there is this, this view of the Trinity as God ne needing community, God being in community and necessitating community and um, how God moves through community. And so the, the triune God, the way that God moves through people in different ways, the Trinity tries to speak to that, but of course it's limited, right? Um, and being queer and being trans opens up looking at God beyond genders and beyond personification. Um, personification, anthropomorphizing God, <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah, and in that sense, I feel like it's, I feel like it helps us be able to see God or Christ in other people if we can see God beyond even our own constraints if we can see, this might sound cliche, if we can see God in nature and in all of creation. And I don't just mean like seeing as in like you look at a picture of a flower and then there's God. I'm saying like God is supplying, God is the life in that flower. And the way that that plant moves, grows, absorbs things, interacts with the environment, has a relationship with the things around it and the way that the roots have a relationship with the things connected to it. That's what I mean when I feel like um, we talk about God in nature. It's not just God is aesthetic and there's beautiful things like the sunset in the sky, but there's so much more that's involved in the sunset. There's so much more that's involved in the growth of a tree, in an animal. You know, um, I think what being queer and trans does for myself, how that identity has helped me see God in deeper ways is that it, it allows me to kind of look at um look more deeply into where the divine is in nature in individuals um especially in places where we're told god is not and where we're told that um, we're actually abominations to be able to reclaim that i think is is very empowering and um because i've been able to ask those questions and um, because I've been able to kind of journey through those questions and have had community journey with me through those questions, I feel like I've been able to um, have a more empowered sense of God and also have a more empowered sense of myself. I think a lot of queer folks, a lot of trans folks grow up with internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia, um, knowing that God works at a deeper level and that God works at a more intimate level and a broader level at the same time. Um, I think it helps give people the ability to, to thrive. Um, yeah. Thank you for that question and for all the questions. I mean, when are you going to type your question? Man? Okay. Um, and I, I guess what I what I say about what I'm thinking in terms of um, how a lot of queer folks, trans folks do experience internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia, um, how that impacts mental health of queer folks and trans folks, the ways that society um, excludes us and, and how that does pay a mental toll, although we don't want to always be seen as victimized all the time. Oh, okay, let's see, Eileen's question. All right, husband's employer out of NYC had some sort of race relations training this week. Funny enough, it was facilitated, facilitated by a guy out of San Diego. I'm assuming that's San Diego and not South Dakota because Eileen and I are from San Diego. Anyway, I asked Lex what the trainer said. He said the trainer African-American man said that the BLM movement should have been called BLM2 to be more inclusive of white folks 
and those who say all lives matter. Oh. Black lives matter too, instead of just black lives matter. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I, you know, I am, since I'm not part of the black community, it's hard for me to like give my thoughts on that in terms of Black Lives Matter 2. I do feel like adding 2 centers white people, if that makes any sense. Like saying gay people matter too means that it's always in relationship to straight people. Or saying that women matter too means that it's always in relation to men. Um, Black Lives Matter, without the two on there, um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that either way we say it, the, the important thing is that we're uplifting the, we're, we're exposing and opposing the systems of oppression that uphold white supremacy and that uphold um, these things that that we are all, um, you know, I don't want to say victims of, but that we are all impacted by. Hmm. Oh, hey, Ricky is here. What's up? Ricky is one of um, the youth that I worked with at Buena Vista. Ricky is an adult now. And um, that means I've gotten older too. Um, Ricky and I, when we were at Buena Vista, Reverend Michael Yoshi was the pastor there. And I say was because officially, as of July 1st, he will no longer be the pastor there because he is retiring. And um, it makes me sad that he's going to retire because I've relied on him as a mentor. And um, I rely on him as a mentor and I, I see him retiring as, a, as another phase in um, API clergy justice work, you know? Um, I kind of feel like, you know, I'm the next, the next to uh, retire. I don't know how that sounds. <laughs> I guess, hopefully, I'm the next to mentor and things like that. Um, yeah, apparently I'm old enough to be mentoring people now. I mean, I have enough experience to be mentoring people. Okay. Oh, I didn't know the Chinese translation of BLM literally says black lives are lives too. Huh. I really think it, it loses the meaning in that translation. Yeah. Is there a more simple translation or a shorter translation that folks are able to use? I don't really, I'm not familiar with the language. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I guess I'll incorporate the, uh, a graphic design rule where I feel like less is more. <laughs> so, uh, I feel like, especially with campaigns and slogans and things like that, like getting a catchy one is, um, you know, really helpful in forwarding our movements and in, you know, it allows people to ask questions about them as well. Right. Um, yeah, we are older, Eileen. I've known Eileen since I was 14. You can also ask her questions <laughs> if you'd like. Um, nothing too personal, nothing too incriminating, please, Eileen. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, being that we're closing out Pride Month, keep the questions coming if you have them. Since we're closing out Pride Month, um, usually folks would be, I guess for me, usually I would be joining in on Trans March because it feels way more fun and way more uh, the communities than San Francisco Pride Parade. I've been in San Francisco Pride Parade a couple of years, uh, mostly because to be visible, you know, as people of faith and to remind people that 
it's not just people of faith like being allies with LGBTQ people. There are LGBTQ people that are also people of faith. Another intersection. And, um, you know, sometimes we, sometimes people forget that. And so um, I used to go to SF Pride to kind of, along with my congregation. That was the first time I went was with my congregation. And um, it was very, very commercialized. I mean, you see all of these tech companies, like just putting their logos in rainbows and stuff like that. It's cool because you get a lot of like free stuff that they hand out. Um, but it's also more like trash in the street as well. It's uh, much more commercialized than uh, capitalist and stuff like that in SF Pride. The ones that I've been to in Oakland feel a little bit more less corporate, I guess. I also haven't been to an Oakland one in a minute. There's actually going to be um, one on Saturday in Oakland that uh, uplifts black and brown folks. Uh, black and brown trans folks and LGBTQ folks. So if y'all are in the area, check it out. It starts at 1.30. And then um, before that, I was also told, I also was notified about an event by, um, I forgot, Spectrum Queer Media. Um, they're going to do a all Black Lives Matter mural. Um, and they'll be doing that from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. tomorrow. And um, I'm hoping to join in on there because I don't, I mean, when am I going to get to paint on a wall? And when am I going to get to be able to say I contributed to a mural? Actually, um, in elementary school, have a mural um, that's on the side of the elementary school building. Um, but now they put up all kinds of equipment in front of it, so you can't really see it that much. But it's there, and it's based on a bird that I drew in fourth grade when I was nine years old yeah along with me being a pastor I was also a graphic designer and <laughs> once in a while um, once in a while I, th I think I'm an artist just like how once in a while I think I'm a writer I think uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, these times where all these intersections are coming together in pride, it's a way for us to, as queer people, as trans people, to really uplift our, to really uplift our full selves, um, whatever they are, especially the ourselves that we've had to hide and that we couldn't be. And it doesn't even just have to be about our queerness or our transness or gender stuff and sexual, sexuality stuff. Like it could just be anything, like being a big old nerd and feeling like you gotta hide that like this is the time to really like let that nerdiness shine right it's like this is the time to be able to do that and um to do it in the service of our collective liberation right that's that's what we all doing this for not just for ourselves as individuals but for us as a full-on community knowing that there are folks around the world who still cannot be fully who they are and not because of any deficit in who they are, but because our oppressive systems are too limited to hold and encompass all of that we are and the complexities of all that we are. Um, yeah. I think as followers of Christ, what we're really striving towards is um, being, um, being part of a movement of the kingdom of God and I feel like that might sound scary to some folks but what I mean by the kingdom of God is not like afterlife salvation type of thing what I mean by kingdom of God is um and some people say kingdom but I, it just doesn't feel me right now to say kingdom what I mean by kingdom of God is like you know not about reclaiming America not for me not not for re, not to reclaim what it is to be american um but to live in a world where there aren't any there aren't any things that divide us in ways that keep us from being able to be who we are right in ways that transcend borders in ways that transcend whatever labels that we have on us um, that's what I mean when I say kingdom of God. If you look in the biblical text, it's not just a spiritual salvation. It's a material one too. That's what the year of Jubilee was about, right? Trying to cancel all debts, 
trying to relinquish all uh, enslaved people, um, trying to let people go back and, and, and close out their debts and go back to where, you know, their families, where they want to be. So um, we also remember that in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says that did not come to, um, what do you call it, to be like a thief or whatever. You can look it up, John 10.10. 10. <laughs> but he said that he came to bring abundance of life, fullness of life, or to have life and to live it abundantly, right? So none of that waiting for heaven to come to us later. We're trying to build it now. We're trying to build that into our new normal. And um, I hope that once we get to the other side of this pandemic and um, that, that we can gather in person in ways that are empowered, in ways where we can celebrate this new world that we're transforming. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you all for joining me. It's been 30 minutes. This is the last live session I'm going to have. Thanks for <laughs> interacting with me during this time. And have a happy Pride. Really take in the last days of it, um, whether you identify as queer or not. Just for real, take in what Pride really means. It, it's um, bringing back the folks from who are pushed into the margins back into the center, which is exactly what Christ did uh, when he was healing our communities and, um, you know, turning over them tables. Okay. Thank you. Peace out. <laughs>